Allow me a moment to welcome thee. I am called the Grand Oak, sometimes the Elder Tree. <laughs> it's a poet tree. A poetry. <laughs> Don't you get it? <laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome back to the world of Dragon Age. Dragon Age is a gigantic RPG world, spanning over three games and over ten years of lifetime. But even after all this time, there still might be some things players missed. Well today it's time to explore our final Grey Warden Treaty, as we delve into the elves and visit the Brazilian Forest, with ten details, secrets, and things. First up, let's talk about some lore of the focal point of this story, Zathrian. Zathrian is the keeper of the Daedalus clan we meet, and he is centuries old. Zathrian is most likely the oldest keeper of the Daedalus clans, and he claims he has discovered the secret of elven immortality. However, as we learn in future entries of the series, elven immortality was caused by the presence of no veil, allowing the fade and mortal world to be one, thus granting immortality. So we know this secret to Elven Immortality that Zathrian's talking about makes little sense. It is learned through the plot of this game that he is staying alive due to a curse involving blood magic. This curse was created to punish humans who hundreds of years ago kidnapped Zathrian's children while they were settled in the Brazilian forest. These humans tortured and killed his son and raped his daughter, who then later killed herself out of the shame of being pregnant from the rape. It probably is the darkest story in this game, or a close contender. Zathian then summoned a spirit of the forest, and bound it to the body of a wolf, to hunt these humans down, and give them the werewolf curse, turning them into the beast that we see today. Zathian has little love for humans, or even most non-Dalish, and this hatred extends to his teachings of the clan, causing a bit of distrust when we first meet them. Furthermore, interesting observation is how he fully realizes that his experience and age have left him less than an ideal leader for the Dalish. If he is left alive in Origins, it is revealed that he eventually disappears from his clan, without a trace, thus leaving Lanai in charge of this day's clan sooner or later, regardless of your choice. For a number 2 slot, Siding of Zathrian against the Werewolves grants you a unique battle axe, Griffin's Beak, an axe wielded by the Dalish Grey Warden who likely was a griffin rider during the time when griffins were steeds for the Grey Wardens. This unnamed Dalish Warden was likely part of Zathian's tribe, and was passed down from keeper to keeper, up until Zathian himself possessed it. In game, this axe deals extra damage to Darkspawn, naturally, and has a unique and in my opinion, one of the best in-game designs for a weapon. More unique however, this battle axe can only be wielded by a Grey Warden, However, the game only registers your character and Alistair as appropriate users. Other Wardens in Awakening or Loghain are not applicable. This axe is also part of a set in-game called Griffin's Ensemble. When combined with the Griffin's Helm, found in the Grey Warden Cache in Denerim, we receive Lightning Resistance as well as Immunity to Flank Damage. While it's not the strongest set to wear, it's definitely a fitting attire to wear for a Warrior Warden when meeting the Archdemon. For our number 3 slot, let's talk about the chest began Zathrian in the camp. Now most wardens have a moderate case of kleptomancy, and are used to opening up chests without any sort of interference. However, the chest behind Zathrian is guarded by Lanaya, who will engage you in dialogue and shoo you away if you try to open it. You can stealth the chest to take it without repercussion, but if you try to open the chest a second time out of stealth, Lanaya will stop you and accuse you of being a thief. She will then no longer talk to you, and while leaving the camp from the world map, you have a chance of encountering enraged Dalis sent to kill you for stealing from them. Now the only thing in this highly guarded chest is a songbook, which has almost no in-game value. The purpose of the protection of this book is confusing, however this songbook may be a collection of ancient elven songs, which means the Dalish would consider this book sacred, which may explain why some are willing to kill you for it back. Overall, if you do want to possess these sacred nursery rhymes for yourself, I suggest waiting until the end of the main Dalish quest, where you can take it without repercussion. For a number 4 slot, we can tell by first impressions that the Dalish really, really don't like outsiders, and will treat us fairly poorly when we first enter their camp. 
Did you know, however, that there is a hidden stat that determines the camp's approval? You can raise or lower the clan's attitude depending on the choices you make in various side quests around the camp. Usually doing good things for people, like saving Anora's Hala or bring Dagon back alive, will increase approval and allow additional kinda dialogue from the Dalish around the camp. If you do evil or selfish choices, Verhorn will refuse to trade with you. However, giving him an iron bark and donating it to the camp instead of taking it for an item will raise approval enough to trade with him once again. Verhorn is a very useful merchant for potions and crafting, so watch your decisions you make around the Dales. For a number 5 slot, once the main quest is finished, a Dalis messenger will appear in the camp. He teaches us how interactions between other camps are sparse, and they only have vague ideas of where the other camps are located. This guy is going to run to gather more soldiers for the Warden's army, and vaguely hope to find others, so it's not exactly effective. Interestingly enough though, if you are a Dalish Warden, you can ask this messenger to find your clan and deliver a personal message to them. He's a minor character, but it's still interesting to see how the Dalish interact with one another. Or rather, don't really interact with one another. For a number 6 slot, let's move on from the Dalish camp and into the forest proper. Deeper into the woods, we can find an abandoned campsite that lulls the warden and his party to rest into a deadly trap. Now normally, how most people play this scene is they go through a few of the camp options until they fall under the spell. Then the party member, who has the highest will, does one-on-one -on -one combat with a powerful shade. However, if you enter the camp, pick the dialogue option for everyone to be on their guard, and then immediately try to leave the camp without interacting further, you break the shade's spell, and a small scene will play of the shade angrily attacking you. This scene is something I myself didn't know you could survive, and I'm pleasant to report an alternative to a near-party wipe of your team. Also, this whole scene is definitely a reference to D&D, as it's entirely just text-based. For number 7 slot, let's look deeper at some of my favorite enemies in Dragon Age, the Sylvans. Sylvans are spirits and demons that take up a tree as a living host. See, while a human makes an ideal host, humans are also harder to take control of, and obviously people notice when someone is suddenly possessed. Therefore, many fate entities choose trees, because of their sturdy bodies and ease to work with. Apparently, these possessed trees settle for killing animals and travelers passing through, but most sylvans that are possessed by rage demons anyway. When these trees aren't killing in a sense, they root back into the ground to remain hidden, and also to gain nutrients for their tree host. These trees in game are so memorable for me because of their tall imposing frame, and ambush tactics that caught me off guard my first time through. It's really sad that they don't make any sort of future entry appearance, as a next-gen Sylvan I think would be quite a sight. For a number 8 slot, let's discuss the lore behind the wares of Ferelden. Dwarven crafts! Find dwarven- No, not those wares, these ones. They are our main enemy throughout the story. Well, them and Zathrian. The history of werewolves runs deep in Ferelden history, but is full of inconsistencies. Some claim werewolves are humans who can suddenly transform as beasts and suddenly revert back, while others say the transformation is permanent, such is the case here. Either way, a demon is always involved with the curse, so both instances are likely true based on the magic used. The real impacts of the curse are just as mental as physical, however, as normally werewolves do become little more than mindless beasts. It was only thanks to the spirit of the forest that these particular werewolves were able to gain part of themselves. This is why Denyla refuses any help despite our quest for a cure. By refusing to interact with the spirit and running off, she starts turning wild and goes berserk after fighting for so long. The spirit's influence only does so much to help this bestial curse, as we learn in Dragon Age 2 that the curse is slowly driving them mad, and even the Lady of the Forest is being afflicted. This quest only shows in Origins if you attack the Deus camp. Thus, the werewolves curse was never removed, but they are still alive. For our number 9 slot, let's talk about this absolute madman. The Mad Hermit is an apostate mage who fled into the woods to evade the Chantry. This explains why we see so many Templar bodies in this woods. He speaks only in questions, and if we want to 
talk with him. We have to play this question game. The most interesting conversation we can have with him is his trading options. We can trade him for the Elder Oaks Acorn, an ancient elven helmet, and a book on Tevinter Magisters. The book just offers a codex on Tevinter Wings that we can find to get a set bonus. The Oaks Acorn is more recommended to just kill him for it, but the helmet can be gained only by trading. While it's not exceptional stat-wise, it is a unique in look. The trade items I recommend using for these items are the book you receive from Kamen and Athras's Pendred from his quest. Now while this hermit is quite mad and a bit of a pushover to fight, he is actually quite powerful mage in lore. Zapping reveals he built a tower in the woods before it suddenly disappeared. However, when we meet him, he claims the tree trunk is his home. Both in this case are actually true. The hermit actually shrunk the tower into this trunk, and it's believed he is teleporting from the tower in the beginning in order to talk to you. What an odd fellow. For our 10th and final slot, the Juggernaut armor is a unique late game set found in this area. The armor offers a 20% resistance to every elemental damage, as well as a plus 3 the strength and constitution when the whole set is worn. The armor is found between four burial sites, three of which are by tombstones in the forest guarded by revenants, the fourth being deep in the temple guarded by a door that requires you to perform an elven ritual to open. Now, while the steps to attain this armor are detailed, the lore behind this armor is even more so. See, this forest has been fought over and controlled by several factions throughout the years, one of which was an Aldmeri tribe known as the Klein. The Aldmeri, you might remember, are the Ferelden native barbarian tribes that eventually united to form the Kingdom of Ferelden. The Deventer Imperium controlled much of Ferelden at this time, and sought to rage war to control this forest once again. A magister named Herrick led the army of his general and close friend Alric. Herrick forged a high quality armor for Alric infused with lyrium, and Herrick's own blood magic. He named it Juggernaut's armor after the Deventer controlled golems, and Alec was truly undefeatable in this armor. However, loyalties in Deventer are fluid, and most are only as loyal as the power they receive. Alec's lieutenants were jealous of the favor he had with the Magisters, and the killing blow was done by his own lieutenants. Herak, however, found out this betrayal and took quick revenge by killing all three of his friend's killers. Then, to make sure the Klain tribe could not get their hands on the Juggernaut armor, Herrick used the last of his power to create revenants from the three lieutenants' corpses to hide and guard the armor pieces until the warden puts these corpses to a final rest. The chest piece was likely buried by Herrick in the temple himself, back when Tevinter controlled the Elven Temple. This story of betrayal and revenge is honestly one of my favorite stories, and the revenants are one of the most interesting uses of blood magic in Dragon Age Origins. Thank you all so much for watching. This is the last of the treaty areas, which means we are slowly coming to a close on Dragon Age Origins. However, we still have Denarum, the Landsmeet, and a slew of character videos to go. So I hope to catch you all there. Thanks for watching, everybody.